Great. Anyway, thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, in, in preparing this talk, it looks like I spoke with your group about uh, eight years ago in 2012. And a lot's gone on since then. Um, you, yes, uh, dialysis access interventions are near and dear to my heart. I, I kind of got involved with this uh, even before my residency when the, the, the techniques for decluttering graps were being developed at UC San Diego. And that was 1985, so a long time ago. So a lot's happened in the last eight years since uh, I've spoken with your group. Um, and one of those things, as I think you're probably all aware, is that the DOKI guidelines for vascular access have finally been updated. Uh, the last document came out in 2006, so it was, it's been a 13-year uh, gap between the old and new. And it was certainly, a, it's a timely document. And I'd like to frame this talk uh, looking at the DOKI guidelines, because I think that they provide a kind of un, relatively unbiased view of how we should, how IR should uh, play a role in taking care of vascular access. Um, I certainly have not read the whole document, but in kind of perusing it and looking at some of the details, one of the things that I think strikes me is there's a change in tone. Uh, the 2006 document really um, had this dogma about fistulas are always best and much better than graphs and avoid catheters at all cost. And I think that that tone has been softened uh, in the new document and it, to a more tailored patient-centric approach, uh, which can kind of be summarized with the quote, the right access in the right patient at the right time for the right reason. And there's a big focus on establishing a succession plan for access before the current one fails based on a patient's individual ESKD life plan. And this is the diagram which is in that document, uh, which if you look in the lower right, basically talks about a succession plan where there is thoughtful planning for the next dialysis access before the current one is even created and revisited before it fails. So um, sometimes a, a, we put placing a graft, even when a, a fistula might be preferred is better in some patients, uh, are gonna need dialysis catheters for a long period. And so I think we need to consider that philosophy uh, as we decide what to do with our patients. So let's start with the beginning. Um, the first scenario, which is uh, a fistula is created by the vascular surgeon and it fails to mature. And we know that happens about 30% of the time and that hasn't changed a lot over the years. Uh, in spite of routine uh, preoperative mapping to identify patients that are going to do well with the fistula. Uh, reasons they fail, unsuitable target veins, um, juxtanastomotic stenoses related to the operation itself, obstructed outflow veins from prior catheters, which ought to be picked up with ultrasound and sometimes it's not, poor inflow, complete competing collateral veins, and sometimes surgical misadventure. So what does Doki say? Um, Basically, there's inadequate evidence to, for surgical versus endovascular post-operative maturation techniques. So um, either may be useful depending on the patient and the clinical uh, setting and the skills of the uh, operators at your institution. So there are kind of two scenarios we tend to see in IR. One is a simpler one that I think we can be very helpful on. This is a poor fistula maturation and, uh, from focal disease. This is a patient Harbor View maybe a year ago or so. It came in with the fistula that was created and simply was not considered usable for dialysis. Uh, we brought the patient down and we can see that there is, there are a couple of focal stenoses here. Uh, and these are, are pretty amenable to balloon angioplasty. Um, sometimes they take high pressure, but nonetheless we can get them open. And here's what that looks like afterwards. And there was a good cosmetic result and in fact, this fistula went on to be usable. And that's the, the best case scenario. Uh, and in fact, if you look at uh, published series, and this goes way back 20 years, um, salvage rates for non-maturing fistulas with balloon angioplasty alone are on the order of 80 to 90%. So we can get a lot of them open and usable. Um, Unfortunately, the primary patency rates are not all that great. So a non maturing fistula that you are for salvage may require multiple procedures to keep it open. So you want to bear that in mind. We can get a functional fistula, but it may take 
multiple procedures to keep it open. A second scenario is the fistula that is not maturing because it is diffusely narrow. Uh, rather than just a focal stenosis, that the whole vein is small. And there is a technique called balloon assisted maturation or BAM, uh, which has been described. Um, it requires uh, multiple treatments uh, over the course of uh, several months, spaced out by, by about two weeks. Uh, the axis is either through the fistula itself or the radial artery. And the concept is that you dilate the entire fistula itself, the working portion, with larger and larger balloons over time to ultimately achieve uh, a large enough conduit for two needle access. Uh, and in fact, you know, if you look at this, this is a, a summary of a variety of types of uh, techniques for immature fistula. If you look at the arrows, you can see the clinical success rates um, here it's 89%, 83%, 55%, 56%. So um, certainly more than half the time you can get these open. Um, this is a technique that I don't believe we do all that often at, at UW or Harborview. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, the, the condition comes up all that often, but it's certainly something to consider and talk to our group about. Uh, the much more common scenario, of course, is the mature fistula with dysfunction. Um, and a, a doki, not surprisingly, strongly supports the use of uh, angioplasty to treat stenosis both the, in the fistula graft itself uh, and in the central outflow veins, assuming it is both clinically and angiographically significant. So that's important. We don't want to be doing drive-by angioplasty. So if there are clinical indications that there's dysfunction and we do an angiogram and find stenosis, then we, we definitely want to uh, proceed. Preemptive angioplasty for moderate stenosis is, is not advocated. And so this is the typical scenario, a, a dialysis fistula uh, with these big aneurysms probably related to the stenosis and that comes in, it's that funk, the axis isn't working, and so we do angioplasty. Now we can see that the stenotic regions look good. Uh, there was some instant restenosis in the outflow vein, which we also treated uh, with angioplasty, and that's probably the most common procedure we do on your patients at Harborview. And in fact, we know it works most of the time. The success rates are about 90 to 95%. The primary patency rate at six months is on the order of 60, 70%, and not perfect, but it's really quite good. Uh, and so if we have half of them open at six months, we're generally quite pleased. Uh, the results are better for radiocephalic than brachiocephalic fistulas. Unfortunately, we don't see, at least in IR, many radiocephalic uh, conduits are almost all upper arm. So we can anticipate the results may be somewhat uh, less beneficial, but nonetheless, moderately good. Uh, and although Doki did not uh, change its value the, the, for its uh, kind of target goal for balloon for patency at six months. I think it still remains at 50%. That means half of them fail. Uh, and the reasons are several. Uh, sometimes if there are immediate problems in angioplasty, either elastic stenoses that are like rubber bands, you open up the balloon and it collapses. Uh, resistant stenoses or rupture, they are less common. Uh, but most problematic is vascular remodeling or neoinmal hyperplasia. So recurrent stenosis occurring over usually two to four months after the angioplasty uh, that causes the uh, axis to become dysfunctional again. So in the last um, five, six years, we've had two uh, methods for addressing this problem. One uh, is drug-coated balloons. And the concept here is that we put an agent, uh, in the case of dialysis interventions, it's paclitaxel, which is a cytotoxic drug. And it is uh, basically placed on a membrane on the surface of the balloon. And when the balloon is inflated, the drug in the matrix uh, permeates into the vessel wall. And the theory is that it will, that drug will prevent the development of the, the smooth muscle proliferation that causes restenosis. And we know that it does work well in femoral popliteal arteries. The question is, what's its benefit in a dialysis setting? So there have been a number of studies, and I will show you the two most important ones. One is by Scott Tortola and his group at 
he's at Penn. This is a multi-center trial that involved um, 314 patients after uh, almost 500 were interviewed. There was a fair number of patients excluded. But basically these 314 patients that had failing AV fistulas and stenosis either in the fistula or outflow veins were either treated, they were first pre-dilated, and then they were either treated with a standard angioplasty balloon or a drug-coated paclitaxel balloon, and they were followed up over time. Um, unfortunately, the results were not clearly positive. Uh, the a priori uh, target endpoint was uh, 180 degree primary patency, and the p-value just missed it. So there's benefit, but not statistically significant. Interestingly, there, when they did post hoc analysis, the 210 day uh, patency rates were significant for the balloon group. But in fact, uh, a second re uh, report that just came out this year, looking at two year patency, uh, in fact showed that there was no benefit. So this was a negative result with regard to drug, drug coated balloons for uh, in dialysis interventions. Uh, on the other hand, within this, this last year, uh, there was a second prospective uh, trial. Uh, this one involved 330 patients and included several, or actually about a thir third of the patients were from uh, other countries, looking at new or resonotic lesions and upper extremity fistulas. Same idea, 330 patients. Um, uh, the results, however, were favorable. That is, there was a, clinic, there was a significant improvement in primary target patency and in overall circuit patency uh, at 210 days and 180 days in the drug-coated balloon group. You know, why the difference? Why was one study negative and another positive? Well, there can be all kinds of reasons. Several that are talked about is that the second study involved some uh, foreign subjects, so maybe these results don't apply quite as much to U.S. populations. Uh, they had much more consistent prolonged balloon inflation than the Lutonix trial, and that may be important in terms of delivering the drug into the uh, vessel wall. And the drug concentration in the matrix was higher, so maybe this is a dose issue. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, we don't know. One point I will make, you may, may or may not have heard that there is some concern that the paclitaxel in these drug-coated balloons uh, can cause increased mortality. There, there are concerns about that when it's used in peripheral arterial disease. We don't know in dialysis access. There's just one um, systemic review that looked at all of the trials to date last year. It didn't find any difference in mortality, so we don't really know the answer to that. Uh, but the bottom line at this point is that uh, drug-coated balloons uh, may have a value. We're certainly not using them as a primary treatment. Perhaps in a patient with multiple episodes of recurrent stenosis, we might want to bring them in. The second approach to dealing with uh, re-stenosis in balloons is to put in a stent graft or a bare stent. And those stents have evolved over the last several years. The, the, most, currently, the most current versions that we use are Venovo, which is a bare stent, and the Covera covered stent, which replaces the flare device. They are not a panacea. Um, we can still get instant restenosis. They can clot, they can break, although less than they used to. They can move, and if they're central, that can be a disaster. Uh, they, if they're put, put across the jugular uh, inflow, they can imprison the, the site for future catheters. They interfere with needle cannulation that are put in the working segment and they could even protrude. These are pictures that I got from um, one of you, a number of years ago, of a stent that's beginning to protrude through the skin and kind of pimpling here. So they're not always the answer. We do use them selectively. This is a patient who had a, a stenosis in outflow vein uh, that we treated with balloon angioplasty with a so-so oh result. The patient came back a couple of months later with restenosis, and in fact, we put a covered stent in. Uh, and get a much better result, and that that axis stayed open for quite some time. There have been a number of different trials looking at covered stents um, in this setting. Uh, I will talk about two of them. One is a study that first came out in the New England Journal about six years ago, the Renovo study, which looked at the use of a covered stent in the 
at the venous anastomosis of grafts. So it's not, it doesn't apply to fistula, just grafts. Uh, and indeed, they found a clear benefit in terms of primary patency at the target site and overall access circuit patency um, from using uh, covered stents over balloon angioplasty alone. There is a second trial coming out, has not been published or subjected to peer review, but these are the results that were uh, presented a couple of months ago. Uh, this is the Covera covered stent, which replaces the flare device, a multi-center randomized trial. Uh, this uh, compared uh, this to angioplasty in fistula, so perhaps more, pro more uh, relevant to the people we see. 280 patients, 24 international centers, 24 month data available. Um, basically, the, the selection was arm AV fistula with its function. It, it had to be some a, a fistula that had been working before. Stenosis had to be significant and not too long, uh, and not at the elbow or in a cannulation segment or central veins. Uh, you can see that uh, most of the stents were placed in cephalic veins, but about a quarter to a third in basilic, and they were at various sites. So this is a fairly good you know, kind of representation of what we see in terms of lesion characteristics. And indeed, um, the stents were found to be as safe as balloon angioplasty, and they were found to be superior in target lesion primary patency at six months. Um, statistically significant and a substantial amount. So here's that 50% six month patency that we anticipate that is falls in line. But at six months, the standard patients had 70, almost 79% patency. And that continued on at 24 months. So very promising results with these devices. So here's an example that I think I did within the last month or so, a patient with a kind of odd cephalic outflow stenosis, not at the arch, but kind of in the central cephalic vein that we, I treated with angioplasty, got a great result, but the patient came back a month or two later, and now there are tandem stenoses where I treated it, and we uh, decided to put in the Covera stent, and here's that device in place, and we're gonna balloon it up, and we get a great result. We'll see how that, does, how that patient does. Uh, just a little note about cephalic arch stenoses. Um, you're probably aware that that is a, a, a difficult site for access because the vein passes through the deltopectoral groove, it's subject to extrinsic compression there and uh, makes it prone to forming stenoses uh, that are resistant to, to uh, angioplasty and also more frequently rupture. And this is an example of cephalic arch stenosis we treated with angioplasty and recurred within two months. So that's pretty rapid recurrence. And again, we put a flare stent in there. Um, so what does K-Doki say? What, what, is, what is a consensus group? What's their opinion about stent grafts? Well, this is what they said in 2006. They actually provided some fairly particular criteria for stent grafts. Uh, in 2019, they're, uh, they're a little bit uh, uh, more vague about when we should use them. Uh, they do advocate uh, stent grafts in clinically significant uh, vein graft and asthmatic stenosis or restenosis in AV graft. If your goal is overall better, six month post intervention. So I think that that's a pretty strong endorsement for using stent grafts. Um, they are reasonable to consider, it is reasonable to consider the consequences uh, of putting in a stent graft in terms of jeopardizing future access. Uh, and finally, they, uh, they recommend against using bare metal stents um, in significant. Uh, graft or AB synodic stenosis. Uh, quick word about aneurysms. Um, they are usually due to vessel wall uh, disruption, occasionally infection, and typically are seen uh, when, when there's a downstream infection. We don't treat them all. Many of them are fairly benign. They're annoying and frightening, but they're not really dangerous unless they limit cannulation sites or begin to ulcer ulcerate or bleed or the skin becomes incredibly thin over them or clear they're infected. We used to put stent grafts in these on occasion. This is a case from some years back at Harborview of a patient that just had a year old graft that started developing in pseudo aneurysm. I'm not quite sure why. And, so easy to put a stent graft in this thing and it just looks beautiful. But it clotted two months later, we open it again and it only remained paying for another four months. 
But we don't do that anymore. And that's because particularly uh, publications from Duke, which have uh, shown the danger in putting stent graft devices in the working portion of a graft or fistula. The risk of infection is simply too great unless you have no options. So K. Doki says, it's reasonable to place stents as an alternative to surgery in these and pseudoaneurysms only if a patient has a contraindication to surgery um, or there's lack of a surgical option, which frankly is pretty, pretty rare. So now turning to what is most certainly the most difficult uh, scenario that we face, which is of course access site uh, thrombosis, that is the clotted graft or fistula. Um, K. Doki again says to, we should use our best judgment uh, in terms of whether or not to declot that. And there will be times when it's better to move on to a new axis and put in a, fist, put in a, a catheter for a period of time. So we want to have a patient-centric approach to that. Um, they are advocating endovascular treatment, but uh, do endorse surgery when, when endovascular means fail uh, or there are lesions that don't respond to it or when you're in an institution where surgical outcomes are deemed markedly better. That I don't think is true at all here. Now, um, this, is, this is such a difficult and problematic area. I, I, I do know where you come from, I think. Um, I, 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 can't, I, I can't get into your shoes completely, but I think what you want is four things. You have a clotted axis. You want, if there are no clear contraindications, you want us to agree to do it. You would like it done that very same day or at most the next day to avoid having need a catheter, avoid a delay in dialysis or the need for hospitalization. You want it to work most of the time with hardly any problems and you want it to last as long as you can expect that it would. So how well do we do with this? Well, first, what are the accepted exclusion criteria? Because I know that when you call down to IR, you may get uh, pushback that isn't always appropriate. These are the established criteria as I understand them. With regard to the procedure itself, that is performing this intervention with sedation or anesthesia, we should not do patients with severe hyperkalemia. They need a temporary catheter and need their potassium corrected. It's too dangerous for us to be treating patients in that situation. Second situation, fluid overload, and I've seen this happen. If they're in congestive heart failure, they need dialysis first, and then we can do them. You don't want them to go into florid pulmonary edema while you're trying to declot a graft or a fistula. Second category for exclusion are related to the endovascular approach itself. If there's a risk factor for full anticoagulation, we can't do them because it will not work unless we can fully anticoagulate them. It just doesn't. Known right to left shunt, on echo or on any other, or CT or, or echo, um, those patients are at risk of getting a stroke if we try to declot it. They should go to surgery. Suspected axis infection, that is always kind of debatable, but if there really is strong evidence that the site is infected, do not declot it this way. Severe pulmonary hypertension, most patients tolerate small clots going up in the lung when we do this procedure, but if they're on the borderline, they should get a surgery a fresh access, and finally graft thrombosis. And I'll show you some data from the Penn group. They looked at the outcome of doing a thrombectomy procedure uh, with a newly created access. And they found that if, they, if the access had been created, surgically created within 30 days of the, of the clotting and then treated, none of them stayed open. So if that's the case, don't send them down, we're not gonna do it, it's pointless. At 60 days, the numbers are dismal, but they are not zero. So those are patients you may wanna consider, but knowing that you may not get a good result. Uh, just briefly, this is not important to you, you would just want a patient that goes down with a clotted graft and comes up with one that's purring, like kitten. Um, all of us do it in slightly different ways, but there are some common features. Uh, we establish venous out, we evaluate the venous outflow to make sure it's a viable access. Uh, we get dual access to the uh, graft or fistula. We get rid of the clot. We get rid of the stenosis. We get rid of any residual clot that's developed since we started, and then we evaluate the entire graft circuit. 
The way we do it has evolved. Again, as I said, we, I started in this work in, back in 1985, and it was in those years that San Diego Group kind of invented what we do now, now 35 years later, and there have been a variety of techniques that have evolved, and all of us use it in a slightly different way. But the bottom line is they all work. The technical success is about 80 to 90% regardless of how you do it. And this is what Doki said in 2006. They have not changed their tune. Uh, we should be successful about 85% of the time. Primary patency of three months is 40%, which is pretty lousy, but it is what it is, and it's not gotten better. For fistula, the immediate patency is lower. They are harder to open, but when you get them open, they are more likely to stay open. So why, what happens when we, you send the patient down to IR for a declot, and the patient comes back with a catheter? meaning we failed. Uh, the most common reason is that the venous outflow is unsuitable. That is, we did a venogram before we actually tried to declot it, and we found a situation like this where the, the opening up the access was gonna, would be fruitless because there'd be no way for blood to basically get out of the access. So they, either the main channel is out or the channel is so small and diseased that it will never work. That happens about 10% of the time. There are other reasons, but again, they are relatively uncommon. So I think we, we approach, I think we're at 80, 90% technical success. Complications, again, fortunately very uncommon. Puncture site complications should be about 1%. Systemic arterial embolization, around 2%. I think that happens very rarely with us. Uh, and other uh, more severe complications also I think are quite rare. I think we do this procedure very safely at UW. So what are the obstacles? Well, I, and I, I think we need to talk about these frankly. One is a disagreement between nephrology and IR about appropriate use of salvage. And all I can say is that if they're, you know, smart people are gonna disagree, um, but if you're getting a consistent pattern where uh, our group or one IR attending is seeming to uh, refuse to do cases uh, that you think are appropriate, you need to talk to me or Dr. Ingram, and we need to see if what we need to do to make that make that change. Second obstacle, of course, are limited resources. This is true all over the hospital. I don't need to go into that. A third, which is a, a, a timely issue, which is of course the the COVID test. We do because these patients all need sedation and anesthesia. We we do have to have that. But frankly, the major obstacle at UW and Harborview for IR treating clotographs is sedation. So the UW Enterprise has very specific sedation rules set down by anesthesia services that are followed very strictly by our nurses. And these are not universal. They are not guidelines used at the VA. They are not guidelines used at elsewhere in Seattle, but they are what they are. And this is the list we go through. These are the absolute and, man and contraindications and mandatory consults or relative contraindications for moderate sedation. And they are many. Uh, they include previous adverse reaction, morbid obesity, and BMI greater than 45, uh, di anticipate difficult airway, cardiomyopathy, aortic stenosis, pulmonary hypertension. Um, and then in the, the mandatory consult category includes advanced lung disease, end stage liver disease. Um, let me give you a perspective. Uh, in San Diego, where I was for a long time, we probably we did a lot of declots, and we probably use anesthesia once or twice a year. In the last four month period at Harborview, all of our declots required anesthesia, and 57% of our elective fistula grams required anesthesia. And this is based on criteria that we cannot change. So this is the major problem, and let me tell you the situation. So at, at Montlake, we have two anesthesia teams that are assigned to radiology. Uh, we share them with uh, MR and body procedures. At Harborview, we have one team that covers all of radiology, ECT, bronchoscopy, and echo. Um, and the IR schedules can fill these blocks in advance, but the reality is that at Harborview, same day cases are impossible. They will not happen. Next day cases are unlikely. We can, jet, we can reliably get anesthesia case if the D clock comes in two days later. Realizing that if we try to add on a case, which we will do, a patient comes in one morning, we say, let's add it on for the next day, 
Um, those cases can be canceled by anesthesia if they don't have the resources. And finally, if we schedule a case and the case gets delayed because we have a pelvic trauma to do, anesthesia may cancel that case. So that's where we stand. I, again, we, we have tried hard to uh, ameliorate this situation and we're happy to work with you all, perhaps even to change the criteria in your patient population. But the bottom line is I think we do a good job um, getting these things open. Um, I think that as far as uh, doing them when we ought to do them, I think we mostly do that, not always, but I think we do a terrible job when it comes to um, getting them done in a timely fashion. So turning it to catheters, the dreaded catheters. Uh, here's what Doki now says, it's reasonable to use temporary non-cuff catheters for a maximum of two weeks. Uh, as far as cuff tunnel catheters, uh, there are indications for using them in, for limited times, uh, such as AV axis that's about to become ready to use, a temporary switch from one modality to another, or a patient with, uh, with anticipated uh, transplant within, a, within three months. Um, there is no, uh, as far as patients who are going to be, get, be catheter dependent for life, there's no maximum time limit, but regular evaluation is required. Um, and there are the conditions that they think are appropriate for uh, basically permanent catheter use would be all ac options exhausted, short life expectancy, clinical condition that would worsen with AV access, such as severe heart failure, or if a patient simply decides that's what I want, period. So what about where to put them? Um, the order uh, I would agree that it's internal jugular, then external, then femoral vein. But kind of surprisingly to many of us, they, the, the Kadoki group is advocating subclavian vein placement before lumbar. I'm not sure if that's a great idea because we know placement in the subclavian vein is going to jeopardize future accessy. So I would say that if, when we get to that point, we probably should be working in the IVC rather than subclavian vein. I think you all by now know that we prefer the right IGA vein over the left. And this is based on just the experience of IRs across the world over decades. We know that they just work better over time. That's true with all venous access. There actually was a study that came out uh, some time ago that kind of showed that difference. Here is, uh, these are tunneled IJ dialysis catheters looking here at right versus left placement and their survival. Interestingly, the um, right side of catheter, there was a difference between right and left, although it wasn't statistically significant, although we nonetheless strongly believe that that is preferred. Interestingly, the infection-free survival was better on the right. I think that's because on the left side, when catheters are not working, I think, not surprisingly, dialysis uh, staff may kind of move the catheter back and forth to make it work, and that probably increases the risk of infection, although I don't really know that that for a fact. What about where they go? I think you probably all know that they, the, they, they belong, so the tip of a dialysis catheter belongs at least at placement in the middle of the right atrium, which means right where this star is, not at the cable atrial junction, not the SBC, despite what the package may say, despite what nursing may say, they belong right here. We all know this for, this is something we just know. This study actually, in fact, showed that if you place catheters from the left side, the rates of infection and dysfunction are clearly worse if you have the catheter tip here at the, in the S, uh, SVC or at the cable atrial junction. Interestingly, no difference with right-sided catheters, but nonetheless, this is where they, we, they think, we think they belong. Now, what about infected catheters? Um, they, Kadoki says we should have an individualized approach based on a variety of factors. Um, this is an interesting um, diagram or protocol that they recommend. I'm not gonna go over the details, but I think it's something that I, 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 I would advocate that we get together and I'd be happy to work with someone from your group to put together kind of a plan because this comes up all the time where we get a, a possible catheter infection, we need to know, do we take it out? When do we take it out? Should we change it over a wire? How long of a catheter holiday do we need? And there's often argument and disagreement between IR and nephrology. And I think that this 
protocol um, gives us a little bit of guidance and maybe we can come up with our own plan that everyone agrees upon. Uh, they are fairly clear about when you need to take the catheter out and delay reinsertion. That is, don't do a over-the-wire exchange. And again, I won't go over all the particular particulars of this, but I think it's, again, we should uh, agree on this so that we're all on the same page. Uh, as far as dysfunctional CBCs, I think that we're all, uh, we all in agreement that we should start with thrombolytic therapy. Uh, when that doesn't work, we will generally go to uh, CBC exchange, sometimes with uh, disruption of fibrin sheath, sometimes not. And that removing the catheter should be basically the last step. Now, I want to make a couple of comments about, um, about uh, the extreme, the dire situations, when all hope is lost, when the central veins um, are chronically occluded and the patient seems unsuitable for a, a upper extremity access or a catheter. We used to just say we can't do this and we would start working down on the groin. We don't need to do that anymore. I don't know how many of you have met Jeff Chick. If not, you need to, you need to meet him. He is a, one of our new junior faculty. Uh, one of the most uh, talented IRs I've seen, and we have a very talented group, but he is a very aggressive about uh, treating chronic venous occlusions and actually is world recognized for doing this. And he does several a week. And this is an example of a patient so a woman with a, a right upper extremity graft and facial arm swelling, um, actually the surgeons had to excise a large graft pseudoaneurysm, probably related to the, 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 the outflow obstruction. So that was the cause of the aneurysm. And this is her venogram. You can see there's an outflow vein from her access, but the central veins, the SVC is chronically occluded. And uh, you know, three years ago, we would have probably just accepted this. We no longer do that. Our group will now, getting access from both the arm veins on both sides and the groin, will do a recanalization successful almost all the time. And basically, they're able to get access through these occlusions through a variety of means, almost always safely, uh, put in stents and dilate them, and here's the result. So now we've got these double barrel uh, SVC stents coming from the right and the left. And uh, this patient, actually, because they weren't sure if the how the graft was going to work, put a catheter in. And in fact, CT venography six weeks later showed that the stents remain open. Here's an even more extreme situation which we can deal with, which is if you can't open these chronically occluded veins, uh, Dr. Chick and several other people in our group will now have the option of doing an extra anatomic bypass. And this is, uh, this is a patient who has, again, axles, chronic axial subclavian vein occlusion and SVC occlusion, where they could not establish orthotopic flow. And so what he did, and this is based on um, work actually uh, by a guy named Jeff Hull in Virginia, where they, ba they basically exit the outflow of the, uh, the dialysis access, and they exit the inflow at the SVC or jugular vein, and then they tunnel a PTFE graph from one place to the other and connect the two. And that's what you get. So here they're kind of doing that. They're getting access from below. They're getting access from the arm. They meet in the center and they end up with this extra anatomic. So it's running through the soft tissues above the shoulder, uh, going from the outflow of the dialysis axis into the vena cava. And in this particular situation, Half a year later, the ultrasound showed that the, the fistula and shunt were patent, and in eight months, uh, the, the access remains functional and the symptoms were still gone. So finally, uh, in the last uh, short time, I wanna talk briefly about um, the newest uh, procedure that's coming online for dialysis patients, that is, percutaneous creation of dialysis AB fistula. So the concept here is rather than typical surgical creation of a fistula, uh, here we are at the elbow between the brachial artery and either the cephalic vein or the basilic vein, that we either create a connection between the radial or ulnar artery and then allow the perforating veins 
to bring flow from the deep to the superficial system and create an access. Or we go directly into that perforating vein from a radial artery and create that fistula. And we do it percutaneously rather than surgically. There are two devices that are now on the market. One is the ellipsis device. This whole procedure can be done with ultrasound guidance. You don't need an angio room. And the it's a single catheter um, that has this kind of these two probes here. You use ultrasound guidance to get into a cubital or brachial vein. You then bring the catheter down to the, the perforating vein with ultrasound. You find the radial artery. You puncture through, which is what they're doing here, from vein to artery. And then through a sheath, you pass the device. You then bring the two elements of the device together. You close it. You apply energy from the handle, and you get a perfect hole and a fistula. Second device is called Wavelength uh, Link. It requires two catheters, an arterial and a venous catheter, that are put in. And these can come from above in the brachial artery and vein, or they actually can come from the wrist. So you can go integrate or rest retrograde. You put the two catheters together, you need fluoroscopic guidance. This magnet, will you get the two catheters in the vein and artery you want to connect. Uh, and this magnet will align the catheters here. And then you apply this radio frequency to the catheters and it will then basically create this hole. And you can, access, you can create the access with the wavelength either from the, up, up, up above the elbow or actually at the wrist. So you have multiple sites for entry and it will either create a, a radial radial fistula or an ulnar ulnar fistula. And that allows, then basically this is where the fistula would be. It allows cannulation either at the median cubital vein, which is superficial in the elbow, in the crease, or in the basilic or cephalic vein. So what we've done is basically taken the current options, which are the Brescia Simino, an ulnar basilic, and then the more typical brachiocephalic and brachiobasilic surgical axes. And now we've added some new options uh, just at and below the elbow. Now, the there are the requirements for placing this are a little more stringent, and it does require uh, that there be certain criteria that you can establish with ultrasound. And I won't again go through the details, but there is a, uh, there's a protocol that needs to be done with each of them beforehand to make sure the patient is suitable. Um, and in, in particular, the differences between sur the surgical technique and percutaneous are that you must show that there is a perforating vein of some size or this won't work. You need to show um, that the diameter of these, uh, the target, both the entry site, the percutaneous entry site, and of vessels you're gonna use are of a certain size. And finally, the site at which you're gonna create the fistula from artery to vein, those two vessels have to be close enough together that you can get from one to the other. Because you can't, it's not open it's procedure, you, you can't just see them and move them. So the results, these are the pivotal trials that were, um, reported by the uh, inventors and industry sponsors to the FDA that allowed um, uh, both of the devices to be approved uh, for both ellipsis and wavelength. Uh, very similar, technical success, very high, physiological success in, in terms of blood flow and caliber of veins, um, similar. Functional success, ability to use them with dialysis, um, a little better for ellipsis, frankly, than wavelength. Mean time to two needle cannulation, 16 weeks, so perhaps a little longer, but in the same ballpark as surgery. However, secondary interventions, the number of procedures needed to be done to actually get the thing working was pretty high. Major adverse events, a little higher with the wavelength group, but not huge. And the primary patency, uh, well, they didn't report in ellipsis, but with the secondary patency was really quite good. So uh, one of the issues with this technique is that many of these patients do require additional procedures in addition to connecting the artery and vein to make the access work. That includes embolization of brachial or branch veins, balloon dilatation at the site, um, cubital vein banding, sometimes vein transposition if the, most of the flow is through the basilic vein, sometimes even thrombolysis with repair. Now, 
over time, um, many of uh, the, the experts and the, the people that are well versed in this have learned to be able to do these at the time of creation of the fistula, uh, which simplifies the procedure and avoids secondary procedures. But nonetheless, it is something to consider. So what are real world results? Well, one never really knows. This is a study actually from um, out of multiple institutions in France published just this year, which in fact showed that the, the primary assisted patency, that is with creation of the fistula and procedures to keep it, to make it work was really pretty good. Although interestingly, the primary, primary patency without those was not as good as surgery. And they, this group, put together this algorithm for dealing with um, fistula that were not clearly working. And so if there's, a, if there's a good thrill and you can, the veins are um, of the right size uh, and you can mark them, then you can just go on to dialysis. But there are a lot of situations where you're gonna need to do something else. So which, if you're gonna do this, which device to use? Well, we're not quite sure. Uh, I can tell you that overall, um, there are more people that favor the ellipsis device and the wavelength, but that may not hold with time. This was a study uh, uh, that came out this year in a group that had used both, although frankly they had used the ellipsis much more, so that colors that the results. Their technical success the same, functional success better with uh, ellipsis. Time to, to uh, two needle cannulation was shorter with them. Uh, one year primary patency though was about the same. So not great um, and actually lower than we were seeing with the pivotal study. So this is something to bear in mind. Secondary patency, modest. So um, kind of in conclusion, um, what are the potential advantages as we move forward of, of considering this technique for our patients? Um, perhaps, it will be easier to get time in the IR suite than an operating room, which is going to which means a shorter time to getting access in place. Um, we can virtually always do these with moderate sedation, or well, I, I take I take that back. In cases where we could use moderate sedation, because <laughs> um, we uh, can avoid general anesthesia or regional nerve block that might have been required for an operation. There's no scar which means no risk of infection in that, in that regard. Um, we are, there are now more sites for AV fistula creation than there had been with surgery alone. We now have this whole area in the kind of upper forearm that we traditionally have not used. The maturation rates may be higher at 90 days. Um, and there's a question about whether there's a greater, greater likelihood of a functional fistula at 90 days, days. I think that's, that will be debatable. It will depend on how well we do uh, when we start. There are more numerous uh, and longer cannulation sites uh, and not limited by the surgical scar. And it may be that the patencies are better because of the lack of manipulation and injury to the target veins, which is really the, the problem that, uh, the reason that many fistula fail. Drawbacks, anatomic limitations. There are more stringent requirements for the caliber artery and vein, both for the entry site and for the fistula creation. You need to have a suitable perforating vein right at the place where people put IVs <laughs> in the past, and, they, and the vessels need to be close. Second is, the, the, in, uh, unlike the surgical fistula where you can do the, the mapping without the surgeon being present, the IR or operator needs to be around to do the pre-procedure mapping to be able to really understand the anatomy or they're not going to be able to do it safely. There is this need for adjunctive um, endovascular surgical revisions to allow can cannulation and uh, this, could, this could prolong the kind of time and uh, cost of, of this method. Um, it is going to require new post-procedure follow-up with IR nephrology, which is something we're not accustomed to. And so we need to have a, a system in place where we can evaluate these patients after we do the procedure to see how they're doing and see what else we need to do. And we do not have a setup in place yet to do that. The needle cannulation is gonna be less clear. When you do a surgical uh, a brachiocephalic fistula, it's pretty clear where you're gonna put your needles. That's not quite so much the case here partly because there's divided flow, which means less flow in the target vessels. 
and, and the fact that there are multiple sites for cannulation means there's a little more confusion about where you ought to put the needle. So it's going to require more education and learning on the part of the dialysis staff. As far as procedure costs, the catheters on the market are about six or seven thousand dollars a piece. And that doesn't count secondary intervention. So it's costs are, of course, very difficult to and costs and uh, uh, charges are really very hard to kind of assess. It's, it's uh, going to take time before we're going to understand that. Mm -hmm. So um, in finishing up, what's the status? The, both of those devices have just recently been approved by the UW Enterprise committees that now approve mm -hmm. devices of this sort. So they will, they will be available on our shelves at UW Montlake and Northwest and Harborview. I do know that John Rollo, who's a vascular surgeon at Northwest, um, is very interested in doing it. Unfortunately, the, our uh, uh, leader in that regard, Sharon Kwan, who was kind of spearheading the IR arm of this, uh, left our group to go to Utah uh, this summer. And so we are looking to find someone else to become our champion for this. We know we want to get involved. I don't know about vascular surgery at Harborview or not, but I think it's something we need to be looking at very strongly in the next couple of months and figuring out a plan. But I think the key is that we need to go into it with a plan, not just sending the patients to us and figuring out how to do it, but how we're going to choose the right patients and manage them properly. Uh, and with that, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Valji, for a great great talk and for taking us through that uh, and all the, the advances that have been made. Um, certainly have some time for questions here. Uh, I guess first, uh, Steve has indicated he has a question about monitoring a fistula, so go ahead, Steve. Yes, thanks. That was a wonderful presentation. And we'd all like to prevent problems before these fistulas clot, and we have some reasons that we might be concerned, uh, an absence of a diastolic thrill or the KT or V goes down or some centers are using ultrasound to monitor these. And I'm wondering if you could share your experience with when a nephrologist calls you with one of these abnormalities before a clot. And also, what are your thoughts about optimizing finding these problems before they clot without having IR do unnecessary procedures and evaluations? Excellent. I didn't even talk about this topic. Uh, but it's something I've had a great interest in. Um, and I can tell you, it's sort of, I wrote a paper with a, a medical student many years ago um, about this very topic and it had to do with physical examination alone to identify problems. We had a, um, a nephrologist at our VA in San Diego, a guy named Tom Ziegler, who spent his life in the dialysis room. And he uh, monitored every access every day. It was, I don't know how he did it. He was crazy. But he would, he had a system for identifying problems and he would, um, he would let us know and we would do pre, we would do preemptive angiography and treatment as needed. And this report showed that we could, we could basically reduce our uh, thrombosis rate substantially. So um, we are strongly in favor of monitoring. And I've talked about this and written about it. Um, you know, there are a variety of methods for doing it. Flow is going, generally considered the best, but of course that's not always feasible. There are other, you know, there are other metrics or factors you can use that are different for fistula and grafts, as you well know. But we're, you know, again, this is, we're, we strongly advocate that. It's always better to get a dysfunctional access than a clotted one. The problem is being able to operationalize it because it requires some effort and sometimes money that, and, and I think the challenge here at UW is there's so many different centers sending you patients that how do you get them all to do that? So I think the evidence is very clear. And I think if we look at, and I didn't go over it with Doki, um, they advocate uh, you know, surveillance and preemptive angiography. Again, the cost, of, you know, the risk of doing an angiogram uh, is a contrast reaction in these patients. It's like zero. Uh, and in fact, in San Diego, we sometimes did them right at, we left the needles in and brought them down and just did it through there. So yeah, I, again, and we're, I'd be happy to work with you or other groups about developing a system, but that, the problem is getting a system in place that is where they, that, that's operational. Other people with the questions, comments? <clears throat> 
Hey, Matt, it's Emily Albrecht. I work with Dr. Valji. Hi, Emily. I mean, my big push, because I'm always taking the phone calls and I feel so bad that we can't get your patients in, but my dream would be a third Nora team that is just kind of owned by cath lab and IR. They'd be more vested. And we, I mean, it's not just the renal patients we can't get in, but that has to come from high up leadership above even Dr. Valji. And, you know, I don't know how to do that, but I really think that would improve our access for all your patients. Because then we have one team that we own kind of upstairs that then, I don't know, when we have a team that's vested and like getting all through all the cardiacs and all of our cases, sometimes I think we'd have way more availability. Thanks, Emily, for your comments. And um, thank you for all your efforts for our patients, because I know you uh, do a lot uh, for our dialysis patients. So thank you. Um, other people, questions, comments? Kareem, I have one question just while I'm waiting for others, which is, you know, one of the situations that come up sometimes is a vascular surgery is placed in access, you know, it's a couple months out now, and even before it's used on exam, we may identify a stenosis, a uh, high-pitched brewery or something, and we think they need angiography. You know, where, where is the right way to go? Is that IR, is that back to surgery for them to take another look? I mean, do you have feelings about this? Well, um, I think I think if they have a if it's a problem that occurs within you know a short time after surgery, I think it would be reasonable to um, approach the vascular surgeon who placed the access because that person kind of has I think not just responsibility you know has ownership or should have ownership of that, and I don't want to if they have endovascular skills and want to not that I want to lose business, but if they have endovascular skills and want to ch take a tackle that, they should have the opportunity to do that. Um, on the other hand, if they, if they choose not to and say, just call IR, we're happy to do that. Those are, again, those are cases that we can, we can schedule in advance. And, uh, and if they need anesthesia, we can do them. And that's when we want to get them. So we don't, we don't see a lot of those, but again, I think, the other, other way to do this is simply approach Ben Starnes and say, how do you want to do this? Should we send them all the IR or should we do it on an individual basis? So we're happy to take as many as you want to send. But I think it's always just courteous to approach the surgeon who placed it to say, do you want to, chat, do you want to intervene on this, this axis you just created? Anyone else with questions? Otherwise, I'm going to ask one more myself. Um, so thanks for showing the data about, um, you know, drug-coated balloons, um, you know, or, or stents, covered stents. So I guess the question is, I mean, if, if we have a patient where we're interested in considering one of those options for someone with recurrent stenosis, for example, I mean, how do you want us to communicate with you about sort of a conversation about whether to consider that? Paging, put it in the referral, uh, email, what's the best way? Good question. I can tell you that the situation now is that uh, I don't think we would, the, this, the only setting we probably use a drug-coated balloon would be a patient that comes back, you know, a second, third, fourth time with recurrent stenosis at a site where we would not want to put a stent graft. Um, and I, I'd like to think our group would just kind of think about doing that. But on the other hand, we you know, there's not a single IR there every day. And, and so each time there may be a different person involved and they say, oh, let's do it again. I would put it in the refer, I mean, the best thing to do is to call. Uh, the second way is to call Emily because she is the, I mean, she's the focus. I mean, with Emily is the, 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 the without her, I, I, Harbor IR would not work. Emily, this is a, call, this is a shout out to you. Um, but she will get that message through. A third way is just to put it in the request, even just kind of as a question mark. Um, as far as the stents are concerned, although there is good evidence uh, for their use, they are expensive. So, I mean, they're, you know, they can be thousands of dollars more than using a balloon alone. So we still have not started using them for every case. We basically, again, as you can see in the examples I gave, we'll do an angioplasty, and if that works, great. And if not, when they come back, we can use the stents. So I think kind of, Putting that into the request is one way to do it, um, and probably the best because you're not going to know who's going to be doing it that particular day. But the other is to kind of work with Emily to kind of 
uh, share that idea with them and plant the seed. 